Hello and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Dr. Sean Manning, author of Armed Force in the Tayspid Achaemenid Empire, Past Approaches, Future Prospects, uh, published November 20, 2020 by Franz Steiner Verlag Wiesbaden GmbH. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. Thanks for having me on. So first, um, uh, well, first of all, what, what's the time range we're looking at just for listeners to give them an idea? Okay. Well, the Achaemenids get started with around the middle of the 6th century BC, around 650, when uh, a king named Cyrus starts uh, starts appearing and coming to the attention of his neighbors. And they end when uh, Alexander conquers the Persian Empire around 330. But I'm also looking a bit further back into the Neo-Syrian times of the 8th century, back into the 8th century BC. Okay. Because from a Near Eastern perspective, what you have is this kind of sequence of empires in the Near East. The whole uh, the thing in the Book of Daniel uh, with the four empires thing. So you have the Assyrians building a big empire that falls apart. The Babylonians build an empire. And initially, when Cyrus conquers Babylon, he takes over their infrastructure, their systems of ruling, mm -hmm. because uh, they, have the, they have the bureaucrats and they have the administrators. And uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, things don't seem to change so much in Mesopotamia and Syria. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, uh and uh so if you think about this if this and i think uh if you look at things in this longer term context not just beginning with cyrus and the big stories that draw this then the perspective becomes a bit different mm -hmm. well tell me um how did you get into studying this subject and, and writing a book on it <sighs> well Back in 2012 or so, I was looking for places to do a PhD. I thought I'd like to be in Europe for a couple of years and improve my modern languages, especially German. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking through universities, uh, universities in Germany and Austria, and I saw Innsbruck, and I remembered Oh, there's a Professor Rollinger there, and also a Professor Bickler who did something about Herodotus. Mm -hmm. And I started trading emails, and I done something sort of similar for a master's thesis. And uh, a year later, I'm starting my PhD in Innsbruck. Mm -hmm. And then things sort of unrolled from there. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about the focus of this book. Um, I know in the blurb it says that you look at these issues from a different angle a different perspective where you look at the um the the near eastern sources more strongly uh, yes I guess. so please explain okay so traditionally H the came the empire and ancient persia have been studied by classicists with a really strong background in uh greek and latin texts mm -hmm. In the 1980s, that began to change as people started to notice that um, uh, thinking back what happened with decolonization and the fall of the Shah in Iran, people started to think that uh, maybe you should look at sources from a culture uh, first and then see what other people say about them and try and uh, bring those together. Mm -hmm. But the people writing about each, each the recent ancient Persian military stuff have still tended to be with the classicists by backgrounds. So they know Greek and Latin texts and Greek and Roman history. Um, and I'm trying, like I said, to re reorient how we think about these armies into an ancient Near Eastern context, mm -hmm. going back to the Bronze Age and the Stella and the Vultures and uh, the Amard Age with all these chariots uh, running around and uh, into the, the building of these empires in the first millennium BC. Because mm -hmm. yep. really, if you think about it, the period from about 1000 BC to about the year one, in about 1000 BC, there's 
hardly anything on earth that we know of that's the size of a decent sized modern country like uh like well, poland or france mm -hmm. and by the year one uh you've got the roman empire you've got the parthian empire you've got the han dynasty in china and so over this thousand year period you have uh these empires emerging and ending up controlling uh, the big parts of Eurasia. Mm -hmm. And the rise of the Achaemenids is, uh, is, is part of this story. It's not, uh, it's, it's not, not just the beginning of something. It's not the end of something that ends when Alexander comes. It's just uh, one stage of the story of uh, the rise of empires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's whenever you study whenever people study or talk about that history, it's always like, oh, and then there was this kingdom on the edge that kept attacking the Greeks, you know? Yeah, yes. And uh, and it's pretty common still to write books about the ancient Near East and end either with Cyrus conquering Babylon or with Alexander coming. Uh, and one of the things when you look at indigenous sources is you see that, uh, like I said, Babylon... Uh, the same kind of people can either run things for about 50 years after Cyrus comes. Mm -hmm. uh, they keep the same kind of records, the same families are still in charge. And uh, it's only really around the later years of the rise of the great and then Xerxes. Uh, in the second year of Xerxes, there's a, uh, there seem to be two big revolts in Bab Babylonia mm -hmm. where probably some of these older families were noticing that things were not going the way they wanted. Uh, so they they raised their own kings, they tried to rebel, and it didn't work out so well. Mm -hmm. And because, and so in this time, 484 BCE, a whole pile of uh, cuneiform archives were put away and not touched again. Mm -hmm. And so from these, we can see that from around 600 BC, when the Babylonians start getting the upper hand over the Assyrians, until 484, uh, there hadn't been, there was, there's a lot of continuity, uh, gradual changes. And we can also see a lot of the details of uh, how things were being run and how people were interacting with the king, whether that king was a Babylonian or a Persian. Uh, people, were, people had to pay their taxes and deal with conscription and so, so let me ask, um, how were, and I get, I know we're talking about a, a wide a range of years, but um, did they keep, what sort of, did they maintain standing armies? Did they do a lot of conscription when they needed people? Do we have any information on, on that approach? We have quite a lot of information because we don't have royal archives or governor's archives to a point, except for some at Persepolis in Western Iran, which don't seem to deal with military matters. Mm -hmm. They deal about taxes and fruit, fruit and distributions to priests and sacrifices and things. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, combining the Near Eastern sources and what the Greek writers like Herodotus have to say, it seems that it seems that the military is based on conscription supplemented by some some smaller standing forces and that had been pretty common going back to say Sargon of Akkad in the before 2000 BC mm -hmm. um, so if you were a large landowner you were expected to uh, provide a certain amount of service uh, we don't know the exact it could be several months long we don't know the exact terms uh, and this could be uh, construction work, like being canals, or it could be military work, like uh, like uh, fighting as a bowman or a horseman or a charioteer. Um, and because of these archives we have from temples and from private individuals, we can see that this was getting transitioned to that um, not everybody was so happy with this, and that but that there were uh, options if you didn't want to serve yourself. Um, you could pay a tax in silver instead of serving yourself, and then some in the army would hire a soldier for you. Mm -hmm. You could uh, make a contract with somebody to uh, go in your place. And 
we have an example where one family uh, 10 times in 15 years hires somebody from another family to do their service for them. Hmm. So they, they pay them some, uh, some silver and they give them their clothing, their equipment, and they, the other side agrees that they'll show up at the right date and put their name on the document and uh, say that they're serving for this piece of land. Hmm. We also see that foreigners are being settled in Babylonia. And again, Babylonia is where we have the best records because if you're writing on clay, that survives a lot better than if you're writing on skins or papyrus. Mm -hmm. um, and because also because these archives are put away in 484 BC. So we have records from before then. Uh, but we don't see that there's lots of foreigners being settled in Babylon. They're building new canals and expanding cities and uh, putting up orchards of date palms. And a lot of these foreigners seem to be serving the army. So it's but it, it seems like people are get these people who are being resettled are getting a deal where they get a they get a farm. It's an ordinary sized farm. They're archers. It was a big farm. They're horsemen. We don't know so much about the chariot soldiers, but we hear something about chariot estates. Mm -hmm. And in exchange for getting them a new farm, a nice canal, they have to serve in the army. Mm -hmm. And we can we can debate why people are coming. Greek writers tell us about uh, people heading into the Persian Empire to work, say, as doctors or soldiers to earn money. But it also seems that some of these are people who've been deported after wars. Mm. So if there's a rebellion or, say, when the Persians conquer, uh, conquer Egypt, it seems that uh, some people from Egypt are being brought back to uh, Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. There's even now... Uh, a couple of archives uh, dealing with a, with a Judean community in uh, Mesopotamia. Hmm. And, um, and in fact, one of the most, fa one of the uh, best documented soldiers seems to be of uh, Judean origin because uh, some of the names in his family uh, ha have Yahweh in them. Hmm. Okay. I'm speaking with Dr. Sean Manning, author of Armed Force in the Tespid Achaemenid Empire. You can find more information about his work at bookandsword.com. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, Please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So um, I, looking at maps of um, the spread of this empire, I noticed that initially as they grew, they went, it seems this way, you can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> they went up through the mountains and took what is modern day Turkey before going south along the Mediterranean coast. And I'm wondering, it would seem more natural to go down the coast than traverse mountains. Yes, and that's, uh, the chronology is a little bit difficult because uh, the Greek sources we have like Herodotus are, are later. Herodotus does say first they conquered uh, Kingdom of Lydia in modern Turkey, and then they conquered the Kingdom of Babylon in modern Iraq. There's a little there. There's some dispute about that, uh, uh, but but if you think if you think about it, there are some of those uh, long passes in the uh, in Armenia, the area like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, but what was happening in that kind of South Caucasus region is a bit mysterious uh, because people there didn't leave us much writing. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so what was the, so I guess first going back, how did this small kingdom or small group 
take over and, and expand so much? What 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 did they have going for them? Do we know? Okay, well, the standard ancient Near Eastern view is they had a strong god on their side, and uh, he made sure that they would conquer all their enemies. As long as they had a righteous king who was honoring the gods and building nice temples and uh, decorating them with loot from his conquests. Mm -hmm. um, so first the Babylonians, for example, put up an inscription saying that Cyrus defeated his media neighbors who were also in kind of Western Iran uh, because uh, their favorite god Marduk uh, uh, chose Cyrus to do that and get the, the Medes out of the way because they were causing trouble for the Babylonians. Um, but it also seems likely the Assyrians had controlled quite a bit of what's now Western Iran for a hundred, a hundred and something years. Uh, that had fallen apart in the 7th century BC uh, and the, the Medes had taken over in that region, but um, it had probably set some things stirring and got people in the area familiar with the way uh, the bigger kingdoms were organizing their armies and waging wars and got people thinking, hmm, this is how we can do things. And then in the south, in modern Khuzestan, which is kind of the low-lying part of uh, Iran that that the Gulf, that the Iran Iraq war was fought over, so the flat kind of marshy part in the southwest. Mm -hmm. uh, there had been the kingdom of uh, Elam centered around the city of Susa, mm -hmm. and they'd also been very uh, rich and urbanized and uh, well organized, and they'd always had connections into the mountains to their east. Mm -hmm. And again. Elam is hard to understand because they didn't leave a lot of uh, literature. They left lots of uh, documents in the in interesting language. Didn't leave a lot of uh, chronicles or uh, long inscriptions telling how good their kings were. Mm -hmm. um, but and what happens there there as the Assyrian Empire is falling apart in the seventh century BC is a little bit uh, tricky. We know the Assyrians invaded the kingdom and they uh, burned and destroyed everything they could. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to the I've been to the site where they dug up the Elamite king's graves and took out the bones to show that they were boss. Um, oh. But it seems likely that something is left over there, and people in Western Iran who become the Persians are thinking about it. Maybe refugees are moving around, and they're starting to think about how can we be like these big, powerful kingdoms? Uh, we, how can we be the ones doing the conquering and not uh, not have big armies marching through our country? Hmm. So how did um how did they manage to successfully fight in so many different terrains? I think that's an excellent question, and I think um it's something we sometimes forget. We're talking about the Achaemenids because they were fighting everywhere in Egypt, in the Aegean region with Greece and Western Turkey. They were fighting in Central Asia. They were in India at least at least sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think partly you could say if you've got a pretty well organized, pretty well organized army like say the Romans have, and the Persian army, like I said, it seems to be mostly conscripts serving for a few months at a time or for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've still got an, an organization there. You can figure out how to deal with different problems, different different areas. Mm -hmm. The empire is also somewhat decentralized. So if there's trouble in one area, the local governors can try and deal with it with the troops they have. Mm -hmm. And probably they're used to the local terrain and the, lo and the people they might be fighting. So if things are on a small scale, it's uh, both sides are likely to know each other pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah, and again, the, uh, the Assyrians, for example, had invaded Egypt, uh, twice, I, twice, I believe they got quite far up the Nile. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the Babylonians conquered down to now what's, uh, Israel and Palestine and, uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Uh, they didn't go farther than that. 
but when the Persians uh, are pressing down into uh, Egypt, they're just uh, doing something that earlier kings had done. They're just managing to uh, conquer these areas and not just march in and steal things and burn things and then uh, go home. Hmm. Um, what were the main areas um, for food? You know, like where there's where there main gra- you know areas where you get your grain or or any other um, food items. There were, and again, this is one of those strengths of the these ancient Near Eastern kingdoms, because uh, we're talking again. We're talking about 500 BC, and the economies aren't very very much monetarized. But there's lots of farmers and herders and the orchard keepers, mm-hmm. and these are often paying taxes as a percentage of their produce, and then these get stored in the uh, the king's storehouses. And at least later on, thanks to uh, some Greek texts, we know that often these are being uh, sold off and turned into silver that you can transform more easily. Mm-hmm. Or if there's needs to be a campaign in the area, you can go to the storehouses and you uh, you hand out grain and uh, barley and dates from there. Mm-hmm. And one thing that's interesting in Babylon is that we see that soldiers are usually bring, supposed to bring silver with them. Mm-hmm. So it looks like if you have an army that's not too vast, you, they go up to the storehouse and they pay some of their ration money and they get a ration of uh, barley and dates and uh, maybe maybe some meat. Uh, and then uh, the king has some silver. He doesn't have a bunch of uh, produce that's going to go, uh, go spoil. He has something to buy it. And uh, he can use the silver to uh, do other things. But uh, we know, I mean, uh, it, the southern Mesopotamia was, was uh, very rich for growing dates and barley. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iran was probably a lot richer than we think about it because 2,500 years ago, there were more, uh, more trees. Those would have kept more water, water there. Um, we look at some of the archaeology, you could see lots of uh, seeds from different trees, trees and the... Uh, Melon, melon, melons growing, and uh, and uh, so, and then parts of central Turkey were also very rich, uh, the Nile Valley. So, uh, and between these, you have some areas like uh, Judea or sort of eastern Turkey that maybe aren't so rich and aren't so easy to supply the army. But as long as you've got once you've got control of these big uh, breadbasket regions. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, raise an army there and use it to put down any trouble in these uh, harder neighboring regions that aren't so rich. Mm-hmm. And what regions existed for uh, one for the silver and two for whatever they needed to make their weapons? Yeah, the interesting thing is, on one hand, the Near East is somewhat resource poor in things like uh, wood or iron. There's a lot of uh, Tin in in the the kind of Central Asia region around the Aral Sea, what's mm-hmm. modern Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but then it also seems to be in, in like the north of the Iraq Syria region that large scale iron production really got going in Neo Syrian times. Mm-hmm. So. Starting around 1000 BC, uh, the, 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 the big Bronze Age palace civilizations are falling apart and people start in kind of what's now Syria and northern Iraq start to get really good at producing uh, iron on a large scale. Mm-hmm. We don't have very many archaeological traces of this like we do in, say, Roman Spain, mm-hmm. but uh, there are, say, Neo-Assyrian sites where when the city was sacked and destroyed, they just left whole storerooms full of uh, iron tools and iron weapons and the uh, iron ingots and iron plowshares just uh, just to be destroyed when the building fell in after it burned because hmm. clearly there's so much of this stuff around that, um, that uh, it just wasn't worth carrying it off. Hmm. And some of the temples in Babylonia we know had workshops producing uh, tools and weapons that they needed. Hmm. Uh, they talk about imports from uh, the mountains of Lebanon, from Cyprus. Cyprus is part of the Persian Empire and has quite rich uh, iron and uh, copper deposits. Hmm. Um, 
of course, there's mines in Afghanistan too. Um, there are some in parts of Turkey and the South Caucasus. And uh, for silver, there were the big silver mines in Greece and uh, what's now Macedonia. Mm -hmm. um, so, and of course, gold, you go to Egypt, there's lots of gold there. Mm -hmm. It seems that that you would need that to, to develop these empires, that pretty good and safe trade routes must, must do, be yes. utilized. One, of, one, one thing we hear about one thing we hear about is these storehouses could also be uh, sort of like caravanserais where or or post stations where travelers could go and have a sheltered place to sleep and a nice bed and uh, uh, pick up a pick up some new food wa food and water. Mm -hmm. uh, from Egypt, we have this uh, Arshama archive where this governor Arshama is sending somebody. Uh, uh, north and east, and he gives them a letter saying, uh, telling them, uh, giving them the right to collect the rations from these houses. And there's a list of the places they can stop and how much food each of them gets and hmm. what happens if they have to stay more than one night. Hmm. Um, and certainly there's probably also these trade routes going eastwards into, uh, eastwards into Iran, towards Afghanistan hmm. and towards India. Uh, in what's now uh, Israel and uh, Lebanon and uh, south southeastern Turkey, the Phoenicians, mm -hmm. the cities on the coast there, like like uh, Tyre and Sidon, are sailing west all the way to uh, what's now Spain. Mm -hmm. That again goes back to around a thousand BC. There's some new uh, carbon dating there. Mm -hmm. um, so. Of course, there's also trade routes uh, north into the Eurasian steppes where people like the Scythians uh, live. There's a famous uh, excavation from uh, the country of Tuva, which is where Russia and China and Mongolia come together, hmm. which has uh, which has some uh, these famous graves that were uh, frozen in the permafrost, and there's some carpets there that were made almost certainly in the Persian Empire. Uh, uh, and I say all the way on the border between modern uh, China, Russia, and Mongolia. So there's these vast trade networks uh, extending in all directions. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, how, how about how about language? You know, how does how do you transcend that issue? <laughs> if you're yes, and that's another uh, trope. Whether you're talking about the Tower of Babel or talking about uh, Greek writers. Greek writers talking about there's all these languages in the Persian Empire. How does it work? Hmm. Um, it seems that the main language for administration was uh, Aramaic, which is similar similar to uh, Hebrew, um, and it's written in a it's written in a what's technically called an abjad. So it's a script like Hebrew where you mark the consonants but not the vowels. Hmm. Um, and we can see by looking at documents that survive from uh, Egypt and from probably modern Afghanistan that scribes in these regions were keeping records in the same kind of script. Uh, they'd learned the same style of handwriting and the same dialect of Aramaic uh, with a certain number of uh, uh, Iranian, Iranian words mixed in because this is in Persian that probably going on for a while. But uh, there must have been schools teaching people to uh, keep records and uh, write, a, write business letters and uh, official correspondence. And then if you had somebody that could read Aramaic, they could translate it into the local language, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. We also hear, we also see early on a lot of records in uh, Elamite. Elamite's a kind of odd language. It doesn't seem to be related to anything else we know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, Again, when the Persians took over Susa in southwestern Iran, the, there were people there who knew how to read and write and keep records. And, uh, and we actually have a te play te some play tablets written in Elamite um, that were found in uh, Afghanistan. They're now in the National Museum in Kabul. Uh, but also things, there wouldn't be that a uh, uh, wide range of languages. And these archives from Persepolis, uh, 
which are written on clay. There's a cake. There's a few tablets and things like Greek, uh, Phrygian, uh, Egyptian. Um, they're they're a very small minority, but it seems that uh, that there were a few people writing in all these other languages. So maybe it was a bit chaotic, but if they folk by focusing on Aramaic and Elamite, they could keep things mostly in touch. And I would imagine that that would you say that in general that would also apply to military matters? You know, running your running the militaries, or I would say so. That, for example, although it's difficult because if you're writing uh, if you're writing the Aramaic script on skins or in papyrus, uh, that doesn't survive so well outside of Egypt. Hmm. So from uh, Esquileon on the Sea of Marmara in Western Turkey, there's a pile of little clay tags that were attached to uh, scrolls, but the scrolls have all burned up or rotted up. Hmm. All we can see is little clay tags and stamps. But uh, in Egypt, but we do have uh, records of calling some troops together to move, probably move sand in uh, what's now Afghanistan. Hmm. Uh, and again, if you've got this system of inscription, it's not too different to tell people to uh, put their hose on their shoulders and dig a ditch or tell them to put their spears on their shoulders and uh, fight off those bandits. Mm. And in Egypt, too, we have this, uh, this records from Elephantine on, Pine on the uh, Upper Nile. There's mm. another Judean and Arabian military call that we can see they're keeping their records in Arabic. So yeah, I'd suspect that if you were if you were involved in military matters, you had to get good at uh, Aramaic and maybe the local language wherever you were serving. Yeah, when you describe a task where soldiers were ordered to move sand, I'm thinking like yes. that's not so different from modern <laughs> modern days. Yeah, <laughs> or I mean, today sometimes the Canadian there's a big flood in the uh, Manitoba, the Canadian forces get called out to. Uh, build sandbag walls and help rescue people, or if there's a big snowstorm, mm -hmm. uh, or if there's a plane crash in the north, you set, maybe you send off a fighter jet because that's the fastest thing that get at the area and see what's happened there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and in the Roman army too, which is a different kind of thing, it's more professional, but we do see that uh, soldiers are serving as scribes for the governor, or they're making nails, or they're uh, building roads, or uh, if there's work that needs being done and uh, these soldiers aren't needed to be fighting or training, you can put them to use of something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm speaking with Dr. Sean Manning, author of Armed Force in the Tespid Achaemenid Empire. You can find more information about his work at bookandsword.com. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So, um, as far as, uh, so earlier I mentioned that you were trying to focus more on the Near Eastern sources. Um, as the primary, um, yes. What what changes or what what new stuff did you do you feel like you determined looking at it that way? For example, this whole system of conscription redistribution is something we don't see so much in the Greek and Roman sources. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see so much about the ordinary soldiers either in the Greek and Roman tradition because the texts that were passed down to us are mostly by aristocrats and they want to hear about other rich guys. They don't want to hear so much about uh, somebody who's not just foreign, but uh, a working class that has to fight with a bow with a spear rather than having a fancy bronze armor or a horse. Uh, 
whereas uh, we have, like I said, a couple of temple archives in Babylonia where temples were probably involved in these revolts and uh, and had their administration uh, replaced in four, after 484. And we can see there that they are, uh, they have, because they're getting land from the king and gifts from the king, they have to provide soldiers. Mm. A lot of these are seem to be pretty lowly people. They have to get their weapons. They have to get their clothes issued. Uh, um, and if we hear about people like this in the Greek and Latin sources, it says something like, and there were 100,000 barbarian infantry or, and there were 20,000 barbarian archers. Mm. I think it also makes us think about what's happening in the this period in generally general because there's one tradition that like today that likes to talk about the triumphs of the Greeks and the Athenians and they're fighting barbarians they've got hoplites and they're very clever and uh and they're creative and they're innovative and they're just uh they're just uh, really great soldiers mm -hmm. but there's another way of looking at things where you say in the end Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great uh rise to power uh they build uh they build a standing army based on conscription um and they conquer all these things in all this direction and then after that all these little greek cities uh are uh back to try to exist exist around these big empires mm -hmm. and that makes you think of what's happening during the Achaemenid period because we have a lot of sources from Athens. Athens really wants to know it's standing up against the Persians. Uh, it's fighting the good fight. It's uh, collecting tribute from the barbarians. But uh, it only really lasts for 50, 100 years. And by the end of it, uh, the Athenians are begging the Persians for help, just like uh, every other Greek city is. Hmm. So. If you start to think about not this, not this, uh, Persian, not this say, as, as not about Persians being the best soldiers or Greeks being the best soldiers, but as all these different cities and kingdoms trying to figure out uh, how to how to deal with this new world where there's empires rising, and if you organize things right, you can become very powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. If you, if you don't do it so right, uh, you can get conquered. And uh, um, I think that offers a, a different perspective, mm -hmm. not so centered on uh, not centered on the Greeks, mm -hmm. and not so centered on uh, and the not then puts what what happens in the in between say 500 and 300 BC into this longer term context. So apart from the militaries, it seems like it was strength came more from proper organization and, and management of resources and riches and, and who you could dispense that to, you know, to create mm -hmm. alliances and that sort of stuff. Yes, I think that's another uh, of these uh, long term things, although if you think about it. For example, Polybius, the famous historian of, of the rise of Rome, also talks about how the Romans had more soldiers than anybody else, and they had such a good system of conscription, and uh, um, and that was a really big part of their uh, success. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the Greeks are always complaining that the Persian Empire is happy to bribe people uh, rather than fight them, and that... Uh, if there starts to be a Greek coalition, it's a little bit of trouble. Some silver ends up in the hands of some people that don't like them very much in Greece. And uh, and again, during the famous Peloponnesian War, of course, as soon as it begins, uh, the Spartans are going to the Persians and saying, can we have some money, please? <laughs> because the Persians had a tax system and the Spartans not so much. Mm -hmm. And the Persian Empire was very big and what's not a very big amount of money for the Persians is a lot of money for the Spartans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a very random question, but okay. for some reason I wondered, do we have any information on what footwear the soldiers were using considering they marched so, so far? Yeah. And that's an interesting thing, because if you look at the Assyrian sculptures, you can see they're wearing these kind of uh, these kind of boots or sandals that go quite up 
tore up their calves, that looked pretty sturdy. Mm -hmm. You actually have some shoes surviving from two sites. Mm -hmm. There's a salt mine in northwestern Iran where every so often there was an earthquake. And if you were a miner that day, uh, that day, you'd better hope you'd be praying to the right gods. <laughs> so some of the miners that were killed in these cave-ins, their bodies survived and they were dug up, dug up in, over the last 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. And we can see their clothing and shoes and so on. Um, there's also from Elephantine on the Upper Nile, near the, uh, just below what's now the Aswan Dam. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's this community of uh, Judean and Aramean, so from Syria, roughly, soldiers. <clears throat> Um, and some of their shoes have survived. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the shows, the shoes from Egypt and from Western Iran, they're built kind of similarly to medieval shoes, actually. They, they seem to be a bit like turn shoes, not, uh, not, set, not sandals or boots with a thick, heavy built up sole. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, and that's kind of what we see in, say, sculptures from what's now Western Turkey, where some people put up a slab uh, on their grave showing them riding on horseback, cutting down the barbarians, or uh, uh, or things like that. Um, so interestingly, yes, it doesn't, for what we have, and they don't have these surviving shoes that we say are soldiers' shoes, mm -hmm. what we have is looks uh, not like what soldiers they would expect, not like a really heavily built up boot with a thick sole and lots of traction. Mm -hmm. But it's also early days and uh, uh, we never know what archaeologists will have for us in the future. Right, right. Um, so what are, uh, what are the, some of the sources? You've mentioned some of the sources you used okay. for this. Um, what, what Can you go into more detail on what you use for research? Before World War I, there were a lot of big excavations in uh, modern Iraq, mm -hmm. and they turned up tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets from southern, southern Iraq, mm -hmm. the, the big Babylonian cities. And um, these got dispersed in different collections, but, over, but ever since, people have been copying them and reorganizing them to find out which belong together and uh, transcribing and sometimes translating them. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also some text Aramaic on skins and papyrus, mostly skins. Mm. They found some, some turned up in a private collection, which is now in the UK, the Khalili collection. These probably came out of Afghanistan since post 1979, but there's no documentation. And uh, these come from towards the end of the Persian Empire. They they, they seem to mention, uh, I think, Artaxerxes III, the king who came right before uh, Darius III, the king that fought Alexander. Um, there's also, like I said, this archive from Lephantine on the Upper Nile and some from uh, Lower Egypt towards the Delta. Um, uh, from uh, modern Israel, there's some Arabic records kept on part, pot shards and uh, scraps of stone. So if you had a, a brush, you could paint your letters on a scrap of a pot, and that was cheap and, uh, uh, and durable, and you could throw it away if you didn't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, from Western T Turkey, there are a few inscriptions and a lot of uh, artwork from graves and cemeteries. Uh, for example, there's this tomb at that Tatterly, which has uh, a wooden inner chamber, sort of like a log cabin, mm -hmm. sort of like a log cabin that you uh, pile earth, pile a mound of earth around and uh, put the body in and you close up and then, uh, but inside it was painted with these uh, amazing scenes. And one of them is a procession with lots of soldiers and the other is a battle against uh, some kind of Central Asian people. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, it, it's in uh, three or four colors. There's red and blue and white and black. And interestingly, um, you can see the cavalry on both sides look very similar. They're both wearing hoods and tunics and shooting with their bows, the same kind of bows. 
Um, uh, while the, the infantry are more different, the they wear these uh, long long the Persian side are wearing these long flowing robes and using a different kind of bow that's more Mesopotamian, whereas the Scythian infantry are using the same kind of bow as their cavalry are using. Um, and of course, we've also got the classical literary sources, Herodotus, Xenophon, Arian, uh, Plutarch, all these famous writers. Um, and these have a lot to say about the Persian Empire. Uh, they, they also have some kind of general things to say. So a document tells you how much some of the how much rations some of this collecting this day, but something like Xenophon will have a discourse on how could how the army works or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have these kind of general statements, but then these come from outside and they're often written quite a, a lot later. Mm -hmm. uh, Plutarch, for example, is writing 400 years after the last Persian king is killed. So that's a big span of time to uh, for things to change the retelling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're being, a lot of them are being written and definitely preserved by people who knew that uh, the Persian Empire had ended and Alexander conquered them. And uh, now it's Greeks and Macedonians everywhere. So there's a bit of uh, hindsight, maybe, in the perspective that, that uh, many of these writers take. Mm -hmm. But that said, I've got a you know a big chapter in my book is uh, talking about people like Herodotus that uh, that uh, people who study ancient Greek history will know and love. Mm -hmm. And I also tried to bring in more archaeology. Um, most of the Persian Empire is in the place where people are being buried with uh with with weapons and things like that in their graves mm -hmm. um it's not a place where a lot of weapons are being deposited in temples like in uh, parts of greece for example but there's still there's still some finds out there for example uh at persepolis when it was sacked after uh after alexander came through there were a bunch of arrows and axes and bows and and uh, swords and things uh, left around that, weren't taken away mm -hmm. or uh, a few things from Egypt, from modern Turkey, and also from, okay, it's, I think it's in Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. It's a site called Takti, San, Takti Sangin, which seems to be the, a temple where people were uh, depositing uh, weapons in some circumstances. Maybe they want to battle, they want to give the weapons they took, uh, Maybe uh, they want they were wishing for good luck in the next battle. And they they gave an offering. Uh, and like I said, there's this interesting salt mine in northwestern Iran. There's uh, this these finds from Egypt. So the archaeology is maybe if any of your listeners are used to Roman army studies, maybe we don't have these enough don't have these masses of uh, arms and armor and. Uh, hundreds of uh, gravestones like we have for the Roman Empire, but we have something. Mm -hmm. Why, uh, and this is kind of a, maybe a strange question, but but why don't we have any Near Eastern histories, ri histories written by Near Easterners or Persians, let's Ooh. say, like we do with Greeks? Well, we kind of do. Like, for example, uh, after Alex. After Alexander, there were a couple of people, uh, Barossos in Babylonia and Manetho in Egypt, who seemed to have written histories in Greek for a Greek audience, telling the history of their countries. And these mostly survived through uh, medieval chronicles, mm -hmm. uh, because by late Roman, by Christian times, people, the thing they found useful in these was that they had a good chronology to use for dating, for dating things and dating things in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh and uh because you know the the greek and latin texts we have had to survive of being copied and recopied and uh for a long time the people doing the copying and recopying felt that they were greeks so they were romans and they were christians and uh near eastern things just weren't as interesting for them mm -hmm. uh now in the near east we do have some indigenous texts mm -hmm. uh babylonian chronicles for example and these tend to be pretty laconic. They'll say the king went here, there was a battle, and he defeated so and so. 
uh, in, the, in the fifth month, and then the sixth month, he went to this other city. They don't talk so much about uh, cause and effect or about, um, and they don't have as many uh, entertaining stories about uh, about the uh, tricksters and who was sleeping with who and uh, all these uh, human details. And again, Cuneif, by about the first century AD, Cuneif form is dying out, even in southern Iraq. And so it seems that, uh, it seems that, and so anything that what didn't get uh, poppy converted into Greek or Aramaic uh, died out. And then again, uh, once Christianity comes through, uh, there aren't very many secular Aramaic texts that get chosen to be recopied. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, well, a fair amount of surviving texts from the early Middle Ages in Syriac, which is the, a later form of Aramaic, but uh, mostly Christian texts. Um, so, and because Greek and Roman writers aren't really interested in uh, talking about what's being written in other languages. Uh, it's possible that there's something like, uh, like oh, uh, so something like a, a Greek history written in Aramaic and that we just don't have it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. What, um, what in your research did you find most surprising as you were preparing? I might have to think about that for a moment because I learned a lot. I guess the biggest surprise was the extent to which um, to which I would say the biggest surprise is the extent to which uh, scholars in recent times have fallen into repeating uh, narratives that were established uh, much earlier by researchers, usually before the First World War. Hmm. And people like this don't get read so often, especially not in North America. Hmm. Most, of them are, most, most of them were based in continental Europe and writing in German or French or Russian or things like that. Hmm. Um, but the narratives they established can often uh, keep re reappearing in uh, much more recent books that uh, don't cite them directly. Hmm. So, for example, uh, going back to Edward Meyer, one of these scholars, he sort of lays out a vision of the Persian army as being focused on the uh, archers and cavalry and trying to outflank the enemy, which um, is sort of based in some of the Greek and Greek writers, but if you read them carefully, you can start to find things disagree. Uh, and this, but this idea of the Persian army being all about cavalry and archers and trying to outflank and uh, relying on superior numbers, but not knowing how to use them, keeps uh, reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring in more recent writers that wouldn't that wouldn't say that they're just uh, copying his ideas from before the First World War. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so I know there are a lot of gaps here and, you know, a lot of gaps in, in information, but was there a particular question that that you'd really like to get an answer to that maybe if someone made some discovery would 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 help you uh, make some determination you'd really like to get at? Ooh, you know what? I actually do have one. It's related to one of your earlier questions. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you talked about the 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 thing about the Persians conquering what's now Turkey before they conquer what's now uh, Iraq. And isn't that kind of an odd order to do things in? Because there's all those mountains in the way. And, uh, and one of those Babylonian chronicles talks about Cyrus uh, crossing the river. I think he talks about him crossing the river Euphrates and then invading a land and the name of the land is broken. There's just the first character survived that's pretty badly damaged, and uh, every time that a different scholar goes to the British Museum and looks at it, they disagree about what it's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read it one way, you say that they were trying to conquer the kingdom of Lydia, but which is in western Turkey, but uh, which is, seems to be what 
Karad this says, but there's some questions, but then this kind of an odd order. If you read another way, uh, it says talking about conquering the kingdom of Urartu, which is in kind of the South Caucasus area, and that's a lot uh, closer. Mm-hmm. And because this one tablet is broken just before it says which kingdom they were going to conquer uh, and kill its king, yeah. uh, we don't know. And there's, there's probably somewhere in southern Iraq or maybe in a museum storeroom in Istanbul or something, there's probably another copy of that chronicle. And if we just found one that said uh, that had the name of the kingdom written out in full and not broken, uh, I think that would end a lot of arguments. Yeah. It makes me think of that that Monty Python scene in some movie, you know, that you know, he said R yeah. and it just, just Yeah, yeah, yeah. The end of uh, the end of the Holy Grail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um Yeah. So was there anything and I know this can all be kind of dry, you know, working in this ancient stuff, but was there anything <laughs> you came across that had a an emotional impact on you in any way, either positively or, or negatively? Ooh. Emotional impact. Ooh. I'm trying to think there. Um and again it's be the it's be the long journey. Yeah. Um I guess the thing I've been trying to bring out is especially when working with the Near Eastern documents, is these may be kind of uh Dry, dry sources with a lot of names and places and the amounts of this and that that are being given out, but they're dealing with ordinary people who are born where they're born and uh, where they like it or not, they're part of this powerful kingdom and the king wants taxes and the king wants conscripts and they've got to figure out some way of dealing with that, just like uh, people in any other uh culture that uh, has conscription, has taxation. Mm-hmm. And some of them are maybe doing better out of it than others. Uh, um, just like uh, um, uh, we could see different kind of, we could see different kinds of uh, arrangements being made and uh, maybe we don't have the, the human details of people arguing back and forth which brother is going to be in the army this year or uh, or uh, a widow is in charge of some land and she has to figure out who's going to do the military service for it. Um, but uh, you just you just think about these human stories that are in the background of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and considering how vast the empire was, how many how many yes. stories like that existed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because. You talk about the empire that stretches from Egypt to modern Afghanistan and from uh, modern Bulgaria to Pakistan. So all these stories and all these lives uh, and yeah. maybe these, these give us a pers- to see somebody who's not just the kings, not just the, the famous Greek generals. Uh, and actually, um, one question I did have, you know, this idea the kings they put in place you know i'm thinking of the title king of kings and yes would yes they, would they put people they knew in charge of these kingdoms or did they just appoint a local who knew the area who they felt comfortable with yes Herodotus actually talks about that he he says he's impressed by how willing the the persians are to work with the son of an old king who is they've conquered or who's rebelled hmm. uh and it does seem like when they conquer an area, the Persians are do their best to keep things as much as they used to be uh, in order. So if you come to terms, you agree to pay taxes, you agree to provide soldiers, uh, and you're not just the... Uh, and you can often come to an agreement. And uh, So for example, in Kalikia, which is kind of the, the southeastern a bit of Turkey opposite Cyprus, uh, there were some local rulers called the Sidesis, uh who seemed to have uh, stayed in power from before before the Persian conquest to pretty late in the Persian Empire. They may have disappeared when one of them got picked the wrong side in the Civil War, but um, yeah. 
And again, that also seems to be what we see in Babylonia at lower levels, where for about 50 years, the same old families that have been in charge under the Babylonian kings uh, are still calling the shots, but then gradually more and more Persians, other outsiders are coming in, and the Babylonians' power starts to be restricted, and, and then that probably had something to do with these revolts in 484 BC. There's actually one famous one famous example, mm -hmm. and I'm going to butcher the name because uh, I'm not an Egypt specialist, mm -hmm. but there was an official in Egypt called Ujahoresnet, mm -hmm. and after he died, he put up a big slab uh, boasting about all of the offices and titles he'd had, and he'd been the last Egyptian king, and then under Cambyses, and the king had loved him, and, uh, and uh, one of the things that a while ago, uh, a scholar with a low and suspicious mind noticed that he'd been the uh, admiral of the fleet under the last Egyptian king. Mm. And of course, to invade Egypt from the north, you need, uh, you need a fleet. So if you have a low and suspicious mind, that raises some questions about whether this uh, naval commander might have had something to do with the reason that the naval invasion was a success. Mm. Because he certainly had a good career under the new uh, Persian king. Ah, okay. Yeah. But again, we don't have the gossipy story about uh, how that happened. We just have his inscription talking about all the big offices he held and how he was a really important guy and knew, knew all the kings and uh, mm -hmm. did all kinds of good and pious things. And please pray for him, please pray for him and offer him some bread and some ducks and uh, some beer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Ducks, bread, and beer. I see. That's the yes. important stuff. Well, that's your basic diet if you're in ancient Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you have... Oh, um, so apart from filling the historical gap, uh, what, what do you hope the book will do for readers? Okay. Well, this is from a scholarly press. It's not cheap. Uh, it's got... Uh, lots talking about what other scholars have said, but I've tried to make it understandable to a wide range of audi audiences. So I've translated all the, I've translated everything to English. There's no untranslated Greek or Akkadian or German or things like that in the main text. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm hoping that the, I think the sections of archaeology, the sections on the Near Eastern texts are the, are the easiest places to get a, a su summary of this that's in one place and, and plain language and doesn't assume you've, be, you've read a lot of other books on the subject. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm hoping that this will lead to a rethinking about ancient Near Eastern warfare more generally and about uh, hopefully early Greek warfare as well mm -hmm. because uh, I think uh, ancient Near Eastern military stuff is really uh, has been really neglected and there's also all kinds of things that specialists in early Greece can do by looking at say uh, Western Anatolia, so modern Turkey or Southeastern Europe, places like modern Bulgaria that or uh, that where uh, there were Greeks living and the archaeology is similar, but uh, but um, so far the specialists in early Greek stuff haven't been so interested in looking outside of the outside of uh, Greece proper. Mm -hmm. Did you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published? Okay, uh, well, twenty twenty happened, mm -hmm. and. We've all lived through 2020. Mm. Um, uh, my father died while I was waiting for the proofs. Mm. And there were some little difficulties with, uh, with, with uh, fundraising and so on. I've got to say, I think I'm going to have to transition from my old uh, file of bibliography into a proper... Uh, citation management system because when you're when you're citing 700 different books and articles that's too much to handle by copying and pasting and manually reformatting to meet this journal or that press's guidelines mm -hmm. but 
in the end, it's out pretty promptly. Uh, and I was happy to work with my publisher. And uh, hopefully in the future, I can come out with uh, some, with a few books that are a little bit more affordable, a little bit more brief, maybe uh, maybe more illustrations. Uh, the, so the, pu the publisher's website said 2021, but on Amazon, it's yes. 2020. When, when did the book come out or is coming out? You were right. It did come out at the at the, in November 2020, and I've heard of people who have gotten it in the United States and in the UK. Hmm. Um, I'm guessing that again because of 2020, they were not certain whether it would come out before Christmas. So they decided to be safe and put 2021 on the copyright statement. Okay. But yes, I do have a I do have a copy right here. Ah, okay, yeah, and. Um, there's a there's a sample chapter on their on their website. Anybody can download that. Mm -hmm. um, I should also say it it's fairly closely based on my PhD thesis, although there's a lot of small changes and things like uh, translating uh, all the foreign languages into English. Mm -hmm. So um, if somebody's interested and they don't have the the money available, they're free. They can download my PhD thesis. Uh, uh, it's free for anybody to read, and it has some typos, and the the footnotes are a bit of a mess, and there are some random chunks of German or Greek in the middle of it. But in terms of content, it's fairly similar. So I'm gonna ask where your website is in a moment, but just to double check, the, so the the sample chapter is that at the uh, Steiner Franz Steiner Steiner dash Verlag dot de, or I guess that's Yes, let me just double check. Um, sure. Because what I see is Steiner, S T E I N E R dash Verlag, V E R L A G dot D E. Yeah. And I see yes. your book. I don't um, see a sample chapter. It's under uh, a probate capital. So if you see this little gray button in the upper left, probate capital. And I oh there it is okay it is a small yes, one right above the anybody to read it's the first I think uh, twenty or so pages ah, of what nice. chapter yeah I'll definitely um, I'll include that link in the show notes so that people can um, read that enjoy that yes yeah, yeah. feel feel free to and um, yes. And uh, I, I, send, I can send you a, I'll, I'll send you a link to uh, the original dissertation too. Okay, good. Um, are you writing anything now? Do you have a current writing project? Most, I'm working on a couple of articles, but I'm also looking for work right now. So um, uh, I think, I think uh, before I take on any other big projects, I need to get work sorted out. Yeah, and yeah. Again, 2020 was a rough year. Yeah. Uh, I finished this big book. Um, uh, glad to get a couple of other small things out of the way, and um, hopefully I can uh, light up some kind of academic work and let me keep on uh, doing this for a few more years. Yeah. Uh, but if not, the book's out and uh, I hope it's useful for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also hope that, that, like I said, I hope that in some point in the future, I can do uh, I can do a shorter version with maybe more illustrations and not so much going back and forth about what different scholars have said. I'm hoping that if I get after the academic reviews come in, they'll maybe uh, have some suggestions about uh, other things I should have considered or other perspectives, and maybe I can take their thoughts, take this first version, and work on something that's. Uh, work on something that's got the same ideas, but for people who don't want to work through uh, step 430 pages of, well, yeah. more More of a popular history sort of thing, maybe. Yeah, yes. Because right now, uh, there have, there, there's one Osprey book on this subject, but uh, I guess there's a couple of Osprey books on specific battles too, but uh, but there's not really anything, uh, anything uh, bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and you only do so much in 64 pages. Right, right. So do you, do you have a website or social media where people can follow you? Okay. 
probably the best is to check my website out at bookandsword.com. Hmm. B-O-O-K, spell like, spell like you'd expect. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a my article page with a link to the original thesis and to articles I publish in magazines and things like that. There's an about page with social media links. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Okay. So bookandsword.com. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Okay. Well, thanks for having me on, Chris. And okay. thanks for giving me some of your time. And uh, I hope, and uh, it's always, I've always glad to geek out about ancient warfare. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your time as well. I, I totally appreciate it. It was interesting stuff. In my next episode, I speak with Joseph Tachowski about elite Marine Scout snipers of World War II. Please subscribe if you want to be notified when that episode comes out. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you like the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you're looking for military history and general history including true crime, Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Thank you for watching.